Hi, this is Patrick from LSAT Lab. We're here to talk about causation in the logical reasoning section. A lot of times causation is set up by some sort of curious comparison, a curious fact. And usually there are multiple ways to explain that, but the author picks one way. We need to be good at assessing the plausibility of the author's hypothesis. And then in other problems, we're going to be responsible for putting together a chain of causality. Let's start with those curious comparisons. We're going to show three of them from test questions. After you read each one of them, I just want you to ask yourself, why is that? See if your brain fills in the blank. Like, why do you think this curious comparison is true? Pause the recording, read all three, and then unpause when you're done. Welcome back. Let's go through these one by one. We're going to see two different categories. Let's get those clear in our heads. A small study where we observe things versus a large randomized trial. Okay, well, what's the difference? How do they compare? Turns out there are more newspaper stories about small studies than large ones. Why? The author goes on to conclude that, mm, it must be because small studies have really like sensational takeaways and newspapers love a good headline. And then the correct answer goes, well, it might just be that there's way more small studies than large ones. Right? A large trial takes a significant amount of investment, so it just doesn't happen as frequently. All right, in this one, what's being compared is crosswalks that are marked by stripes and lights versus crosswalks that are not so adorned. And the comparison is that there's more pedestrian injuries happening at the marked crosswalks than the unmarked ones. That's weird. Why? Are there more injuries at the marked ones? Well, the author goes on to conclude, clearly these safety measures, these lights and these stripes are doing nothing. Look, there's more injuries here. They're making the situation worse. And LSAT wants us to consider the alternate explanation. Maybe these were the worst crosswalks to begin with, and the stripes and lights are there trying to make a bad situation slightly better. This one's comparing people who read the labels on their food products to people who don't read. And it's saying that the ones who don't read have a higher percentage of fat calories in their diet. Hmm, curious. Why is that? Let's look at one more that you haven't seen yet. All right, Jimmy replaced his old gas water heater with a new one that's rated as highly efficient, but his gas bills went up. So this is a comparison between then and now. He used to have the old gas water heater, and now he's got the new highly efficient one and yet his gas bill's gone up? That's paradoxical. LSAT wants us to be intrinsically confused and thinking, why is that? But you need to build a habit that you actually make your brain say that question, ask it. So make your brain think, well, so wait, why is his gas bill higher with this new heater? Does the new heater suck? Is something else changed? Why are newspapers doing more stories on small studies than big ones? Why are there more pedestrians getting hurt at these brightly advertised crosswalks. How come the people who are reading the food label have less fat in their diet? It's important that we develop an ear for curious comparisons so that we can pause and relate to the author, empathize with her and think, huh, why is that? Once we've asked the question, why is that? Our human brains can't help but start trying to speculate some possible explanations for it. Here's a question that is all about coming up with four possible explanations for the same curious fact. Pause the recording, give it a try, and then unpause when you're ready to hear about it. So this question is explain the paradox, resolve the paradox, and it's an accept question. So four answers will help to explain our surprise. One of them will either do nothing or make the surprise worse. And here the correct answer is A. This actually makes it even more surprising because this is saying that his new water heater uses a smaller percentage of gas. So wait, why are his gas bills going up if the new heater uses a smaller percentage of gas? This makes us even more confused. That's why it's our correct answer. But I wanna look at the four that give us different explanations. So how come this new water heater life of his has a higher gas bill than the old water heater life he, he lived? Well, B is saying it's because his uncle moved in. So the difference between now and before is two people versus one. Does it say that the uncle actually uses the sink or the shower or the toilet? No, but go ahead and use common sense. 
C is saying that what's different between now and then is now he does laundry at home, whereas he didn't before. Do we know that doing laundry at home means more gas usage than when you didn't do laundry at home? Here, yeah, even without common sense, it says he started using a gas dryer. D is saying that, well, the thing that's changed is they jacked up my rates. So even though I've got this new heater, I've got higher rates to pay. And then E gives us a story where there's something anomalous. The reason his bill's higher than usual is because the weather's colder than usual. So he just needs to run a heater more than he usually would run a heater. The variety of possible storylines is part of the richness of causality. Maybe his uncle moved in. Maybe now he's doing laundry at home. Maybe the utility company jacked up the rates. Maybe it's just really cold, so everybody's running their heater a lot. We're totally allowed to use common sense when it comes to filling in the blanks for potential explanations. You don't want to invent a crazy story, like if we found out that Jimmy just got promoted at his job. I don't know why he'd be using his gas more. I could make up a story, but there's no common sense connection between getting promoted and using your gas more. Already I'm thinking, well, now that he knows he's making more money, he feels like he can turn the heat up. <laughs> That's too much of a story. Because there are multiple ways to explain, it's a flaw when an author commits to one of them. Whenever we talk about sort of causal flaws, we're really referring to this, that an author's overconfident about one specific storyline when there could be other storylines. Pause the recording and try this one. Unpause when you're done. Welcome back. This is a flaw question. It's asking us how the argument is vulnerable to criticism. So what's wrong with it? How is it flawed? A is the correct answer. The four wrong answers are famous flaws, such as sampling, possible versus certain, necessary versus sufficient, or an inappropriate appeal to a source that might not be an expert. If you're unfamiliar with these famous flaws, there's about 10 to 15 of them. If you want to uh, click open this video in another tab, you can come check out those later. The correct answer is saying that the author inferred a cause from a mere correlation. That's a foul ball. Whenever an answer choice on flaw says the author inferred this from that, the thing you infer is the conclusion. To draw a conclusion is synonymous with to draw an inference. You can actually think your way through these answer choices by just seeing whether they match. First, you just have to find the conclusion in the evidence. So the word but tells you that usually we're leaving background counterpoint and now beginning the author's argument. So we can ignore the first sentence, but we got to figure out, you know, are we getting conclusion and then evidence or evidence and then conclusion? And the so tells us that the conclusion comes second. So is our conclusion a cause? Yes, because it says trading my sports car in for a minivan would lower my risk. These active verbs signify some sort of causal influence. Is the evidence a correlation? Do we have ourselves a little curious comparison? We do. We're comparing minivans and sedans to sports cars, and we're saying one is higher or lower when it comes to an accident rate. So if we heard this curious comparison, we were one step ahead of the game. How do they compare? Sports car drivers are getting into more accidents? Hmm, why? The author is looking at this curious comparison, asking herself why, and coming away with the idea that the sports car is an inherently riskier car to drive. And that's a flaw because that doesn't have to be the explanation. There's multiple ways to explain a correlation. Let's clarify what correlations are. We gotta get really good at hearing them. You've got statistical correlations where you hear that like most people in this group have a certain trait. College graduates tend to have good vocab. Or you get an idea that this group's more likely or less likely than this group to have some certain trait. College grads are more likely than non-college grads to have sophisticated vocab. Another way to express this lumpiness in the statistics is to just show disproportionate representation. Liberals are only 53% of the population, but 79% of university professors. Whoa, why? What's skewing it that way? Correlations can also be temporal. You can say 
hey, we raised the speed limit and then the traffic fatalities went down. So I guess the speed limit did it. That's like a before after. Or you can kind of do simultaneous correlations. Tommy's taxi started offering free breath mints around the same time that Uber's drivers were. When you see a correlation, it can be useful to picture those two factors appearing in parallel. There's some association. What is it? The author always assumes a causal one. Here, with this conclusion, our author would be saying that going to college is causing the advanced vocab. It leads to. Other verbs would be like, it promotes. It contributes to. It influences. Sometimes causal conclusions don't explicitly name cause-effect. They just imply it. So picture this one. I guess the crackdown on plagiarism is making students check their thesaurus. That's like an obnoxiously cryptic way of saying that being at college and not being allowed to plagiarize some source is leading you to search out new wording, which is building your vocab. So it's telling a rich causal story that we actually need to sort of vocalize internally. What is the author in imagining? But in a very simple way, we want to look at this correlation and think, okay, the author thinks that the left side leads to the right side. But it doesn't have to be that way. Given that X is correlated with Y, you're not allowed to conclude that X causes Y. First of all, maybe Y causes X. We should always ask ourselves, which of these came first? Did they have the advanced vocab before they got to college? We call this sort of thing reverse causality. Meaning, have you considered that maybe it's the other way around? We're not allowed to be sure of it. We can't say definitively, author, you've mistaken cause for effect. That's too sure. But we can say you've failed to consider that maybe it's the other way around. Here it definitely makes some common sense why you might have needed an advanced vocab to get into college. Maybe you're, if your essay didn't sparkle with some scintillating vernacular, then you wouldn't have gotten admitted. The other popular alternative explanation for a correlation is that there's some third factor we haven't identified yet that is really the causal difference maker. So sometimes it's causing both things, sometimes it causes one and just happens to be associated with the other, but it's the real reason these two factors are going hand in hand. One we could stipulate would be maybe just being wealthy. Maybe wealthy families are more likely to have advanced vocab and they're also more likely to get their kids through college. If you think about the argument we were reading, there was a correlation between driving a sports car and having a higher rate of getting into accidents. And our author blamed it on the sports car. She was like, oh, okay, well, if I trade in my sports car, I'll lower my risk. We could consider reverse causality, but it doesn't really make sense to say the higher accident rate came first and then you got the sports car, unless we're thinking about this third factor idea of like, well, yeah, you're getting into accidents all the time because you are an obnoxious, thrill-seeking driver. And that same personality trait is making you buy a sports car once you can afford it. There's multiple ways to explain a correlation, so it's a flaw for an author to just assume one thing causes another. In addition to chasing down alternate storylines, the test is going to ask us to evaluate or assess the plausibility of the author's storyline. In general, when you see a causal argument where you get some curious fact, which is almost always some curious comparison, and then the author goes on to go, hmm, this must explain it. There's two different pressure points. One is, is there some other way we could explain it? And the other one is, okay, how plausible is the author's hypothesis? What information could help me assess whether the author's storyline seems right or seems wrong? Take a look at this strengthen accept question. Pause the recording and unpause when you're done. Welcome back. So there's a curious comparison, which is the land party got its only national victory in 1935. So we're kind of comparing 1935 to every other year. And what was different is the land party won a national election. Huh, why is that? Why? So the author has a theory. She says, well, I think it was due to a combination of two things. The land party specifically spoke to the problems of those hard hit rural, semi-rural areas. And um, those areas were really suffering. How would we assess the plausibility of this? The most common way that LSAT will strengthen plausibility 
is by showing you an answer where the cause was absent and the effect was absent. So in this argument, our author thinks, for example, that them specifically addressing the concerns of these groups helped them win the election. So a no cause, no effect answer would sound like when they didn't address their concerns, they didn't win the election. And A actually looks like it's doing that. It sounds like in the preceding elections, which we know they lost, they didn't make an attempt to address the economically distressed group. The problem is this is talking about urban and we are talking about rural and semi-rural voters. Since this ends up being irrelevant, it's our correct answer because it doesn't strengthen the argument. Choice B strengthens basically by explaining the causal mechanism. Like how would focusing on their problems lead to them winning? B is explaining, well, because when voters feel like you're focusing on their problems, they're more likely to vote for you. C strengthens by giving more data points that match the cause and effect are appearing together. In other times when the land party had success, we know they only won this one national election, but maybe they've won regional elections, local ones. It was when there was economic distress. So the author thought economic distress in the agricultural sector was a cause for the success in this election. C is reinforcing that connection. It's saying, yeah, most of the time they've been successful. There's been economic distress in the agricultural sector. That's still just a correlation, but it helps. It's more data points that show cause and effect going hand in hand. D strengthens in a way similar to A. The parties that didn't win in 1935 didn't specifically address these people. So we could think of it as a no cause, no effect. Another way to think about this one is if our author thinks that what the land party did right was they specifically addressed the problems of the rural and semi-rural people, he must be implicitly assuming that the other parties didn't. So this is sort of spelling out an assumption. It can't be a causal difference maker if it wasn't actually a difference to begin with. This is affirming the other parties did not campaign in those semi-rural areas. Choice E is making a connection between the economic distress you're in and your likelihood of voting. So we know that the rural semi-rural people were in economic distress. This answer then tells us they were very likely to vote. And that helps because the author had identified, you know, the bulk of the population is rural semi-rural. But someone might have objected, yeah, but they don't vote. The bulk of the voters were in urban areas. E is ruling out that objection. It is saying, no, 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 the rural, semi-rural were not only like most of the population, they were the ones most likely to vote. So they were a really important demographic to reach out to. Causal arguments are some of the most complex things on the test because we really have two different ways of analyzing them. So you'll need to be always asking yourself two different questions. Any other way that we could explain this curious comparison, this background fact? How plausible is the author's storyline? What information would make me believe it more or believe it less? When it comes to alternate explanations, reverse causality and third factor are the big ideas to remember. When it comes to plausibility answers, all these sort of covariation answers, which means, you know, here the cause was absent and the effect was absent. We can also weaken with covariation by saying, hey, your supposed cause was in this situation, but the effect wasn't there. So you weaken with cause-effect mismatches. You strengthen with cause-effect matches. We can also establish plausibility by just explaining how it would work or indicating there definitely is a distinction here if the author needs there to be some distinction. When it comes to strengthen and weaken, there's a definite bias to each of them that's worth keeping in mind, but it's just a tendency. You definitely will see strengthen and weaken do answers of both kinds. But if I'm doing strengthen, I'm focusing more on helping the author's storyline. When I do weaken, I'm focused much more on finding an alternate storyline. Necessary assumptions somewhere in between those two, pretty equally likely to do either. Evaluate and flaw are way more on that side of presenting alternate storylines. Flaw really just can describe the fact that the author was so sure of herself in coming to a causal conclusion. It doesn't even have to propose an alternate storyline. 
it can just say, hey, the fact that alternate storylines exist means you shouldn't be so sure of yourself. Our last topic shifts our emphasis a little bit more towards the inference family, where we are getting facts and being asked to see what we could derive from them. Pause the recording and try this problem. Okay, welcome back. This is a most supported question, which we can most easily tell by the word statements. We're not reading an argument. There is not a premise or a conclusion. Our reading job here is just to read these facts and see if we can connect any of them. And in particular, we look to see whether there's like conditional logic rules that we could apply or chain together. Are there causal connections we can put together? Is there some sort of pivot where we reconcile what came before it with what came after it? When we read this paragraph, we want the causal language to jump out at us. These things tend to isolate. That's causal. This has the effect of, ooh, that's causal. This in turn discourages. All right, we've got ourselves a causal chain. The first sentence is just saying two facts. The media rarely covers local politics and local politics is usually secretive. But then we get into some causality. These tend to do this. And then we say, and what, what happens when we isolate local politicians? Well, this has the effect of that. What happens when we reduce the chance that any particular resident participation is a meaningful thing? Well, that in turn discourages this. So if you just focus on those keywords, you can see the shape of what they're trying to build. And since the goal of this is to connect facts, if you have a causal chain, the most typical type of correct answer would say, all right, well, so X leads to C, Y leads to C. It's also correct to say X leads to B. So sometimes you'll see correct answers that just reinforce part of the chain. All right, so let's insert the actual ideas into our causal chain. When we look at the answer choices, the correct answer is D, which is saying, if we were to cover local politics more in the media, then you wouldn't have that discouraging resident participation. You would reduce at least one source. It's very safe language. The one thing that might freak people out about picking this correct answer is that we were told that the media doesn't cover local and that is discouraging residents. Whereas D is saying, yeah, but does that mean if they did cover local politics, it wouldn't discourage? That can feel illegal because in conditional logic, if you have if A, then B, you're not allowed to say if not A, not B. But with causality, it's a little bit different. If you say that A caused B, then you are allowed to say, you know, if you didn't have A, you wouldn't have had B. Or if you had less of A, you'd have less of B. These are supportable inferences. They're not must be true, but LSAT routinely gives correct answers in this form on a most supported question. If I say, if you can surf, you have great balance, you're definitely not allowed to say, if you can't surf, you don't have great balance. What about ballerinas or yoga instructors? However, if I say, Simone surfing has the effect of keeping her skin very tan, then I am allowed to say that it's a supportable inference to think that if she were to surf much less, her skin wouldn't be as tan. So D is doing something you'll see a lot on reading comp and inference questions, which is saying if this causal difference maker weren't present, then we wouldn't see the effect or we'd see less of the effect. A was unsupportable because it distorted the meaning of any particular act of resident participation, which just meant any random event on average will have a lower chance of eliciting a positive response. A is actually saying there are specific, there are particular acts that would elicit a positive response. That's completely changing the meaning of how we were using particular. B is pretty close because it does reinforce a connection between local politics being secretive and discouraging resident participation, but the should is out of scope. Our author was only listing out descriptive ideas, so it's straying a little bit farther from what we were given to start making normative claims like should, ought, good, bad. 
C is a classic too strong wrong answer. We can't say from these facts what is the number one factor influencing a resident's decision. And E tries to go backwards. It almost feels like it's doing a contrapositive, but you're not allowed to do that with cause-effect relationships. Suppose I were to tell you that I have an extra lip on my right cheek. I have three lips. And because of that, this has the effect of getting me teased on the playground. E would be saying, if Patrick weren't teased, this would cause him to not have a third lip on his face. You can't do that with causality. All right, so let's recap. Curious comparisons are our gateway to anticipating a causal conclusion. We wanna get real good at hearing wording like, we tend to be this, we're more likely to be that or hearing temporal relations like before and after, or from this to that, or even at the same time, while this was happening, this was happening. We know the author is going to be an eager beaver about coming to one precise causal hypothesis, and we need to be able to create some doubt by thinking, well, couldn't there be other ways to explain? The most common other ways to explain are reverse causality or some third factor. But you'll also see answers that are saying the data is just bad because we used an unrepresentative sample or we're making like an unfair comparison between two groups or something about our, the methodology of this experiment is shady. And once in a while, you'll see that they explain something as just a return to normalcy, a regression to the mean. When it comes to answers that either improve or diminish the plausibility of the author's storyline, the most common type is covariation, which just means you're getting more data points that show you that cause and effect either like appear together or disappear together, or weakening data points that show there's a mismatch. One of them appeared, but the other one didn't appear. Less commonly are correct answers that talk about how the causality would work, answers that just clarify there is a difference. <laughs> this difference maker was unique to the person I'm assigning it to or that in some other way, just establish a baseline of plausibility. Okay, yes, the, the thing I am blaming or crediting was there and it is capable of doing what I'm claiming it did. When it comes to seeing causal chains, we gotta get better at spotting causal keywords. They're almost always active verbs like leads to, due to, because of, resulting in. And we wanna be at peace with this inference that you're allowed to do on most supported tasks, whether it's reading comp or logical reasoning. You're allowed to say, if the causal difference maker hadn't been there, the effect wouldn't have been there. All right, thanks a lot for joining us. Please check out some of our other videos or come visit us on lsatlab.com.